Chapter Twelve of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. Bunny's Waterfall. Bunny Brown and his sister Sue at first did not know what the hired man meant. They did not see why they could not stay and play with the queer little boxes, which, as Sue said, were just like doll houses. She was even going back to the farmhouse and get one of her dolls, for she had brought three or four with her in the big automobile. But now the hired man was running toward Bunny and Sue. He had stopped weeding the onions. "'Run away! Run away!' he cried again, waving his arms at the children. "'Run away! Hurry!' "'What for?' asked Bunny. Bunny was always good at asking questions. "'Why should we run?' Bunny asked. Before the man could answer, Sue cried out, "'Oh, Bunny, look at the flies. They're buzzing all around me. I don't like them. Come on.' At the same time, a number of the flies, as Sue called them, began buzzing around Bunny's head. He waved his hands to drive them off. "'Don't do that. Keep your arms still and come away,' cried the hired man. "'If you don't run away, you'll be badly stung.' By this time he was close to Bunny and Sue. He caught the little boy up in one arm and Sue in the other and ran with them away from the little playhouses. Then, when they were some distance from the buzzing insects, the man put the children down. "'Never go there again,' he said. "'Why?' asked Bunny. "'Why mustn't we go near the flies?' "'Because those are not flies. They are bees. They may sting you and hurt you very much. You must keep away from them.' "'But don't bees give you honey?' asked Sue. "'Yes, little lady, they do. But if you go near their hives, they think you are going to take their honey. They don't like that, so they sting folks to drive them away.' "'We didn't know they was beehives,' said Sue, looking up to see if any of the bees were still buzzing around her. "'We thought they were playhouses,' said Bunny, "'and I was going to take the top off one and look inside.' "'It's a good thing you didn't,' said the man. Now remember, keep away from the bees. But how does Grandpa get the honey out without being stung, Bunny wanted to know. He blows smoke on them from a smoking machine, said the hired man. The smoke quiets the bees, and then they don't sting. Of course, your Grandpa leaves the bees some honey for themselves. They have to have some to eat when it is winter, and when there are no flowers. Do flowers make honey? asked Sue. The bees suck honey from the flowers, the hired man told the children. Now run away and don't ever again play in that part of the garden where the bees are. We won't, promised Bunny and Sue. Oh, my goodness, exclaimed Grandpa Brown when Bunny and Sue told him what had happened. I forgot to speak about the bees. You see, I didn't have any when you were here before, and now I should have told you to keep away from them. I'm glad the hired man saw you in time, or you might have been badly stung. Does it hurt to be stung, Bunny wanted to know? Indeed it does, his father told him. It's worse than fifty mosquito bites made into one, so keep away from the bees. Bunny and Sue were sure they would. They told about having fed the horse, and how the old ram pulled Bunny by the coat. The next day, Bunny and Sue started in to have all sorts of good times on Grandpa Brown's farm. Early in the morning, they got up and had breakfast. Then, wearing their old clothes so they could romp and roll as they liked, they began the day. First, they went with Grandma Brown to feed the chickens. Mother Brown also went with them. And how the hens and roosters flocked about Grandma when she scattered the feed. And now we'll gather the eggs, she said, as she tossed down the last grains of corn. Oh, I know how to hunt eggs, cried Sue. I hunted some once for Mrs. Gordon, who lives next door to us. She sat in the nest, laughed Bunny. Well, I hope you don't do that here, said Sue's mother, smiling. Sue had no such bad luck. Indeed, it was easy to hunt the eggs on Grandpa's farm, for the hens were all kept in houses and yards with wire fences about them so they could not fly away and hide their nests. The eggs were all in cute little boxes, and all Grandma had to do 
was to lift up the cover and take the eggs out. Bunny and Sue helped put the eggs in baskets, but they did not carry them, for fear they would spill and break them. Break the eggs, not the baskets, I mean, for if you break a basket you can fix it, but if you break an egg no one can mend it. You have to eat it. After the eggs were gathered, they all went to pick strawberries. That is, Grandma and Mother Brown and Bunny and Sue did. Papa Brown, with Grandpa and Bunker Blue, went over to look at some colts or little horses in a field or pasture far from the house. Oh, I wish I could see the pony, said Sue. Bunny wished so, too. The next time you may, his father said. We'll have fun getting strawberries, said Grandma Brown, and the children did. They picked the big red sweet strawberries, putting them in baskets. They would have some of them for dinner with cream and sugar. And for supper I'll make a strawberry shortcake, promised Grandma Brown. Bunny and Sue thought it was great fun to pick the berries. Of course they ate almost as many as they put in the baskets, but that was all right and just what Grandma expected. Strawberries were made for children to eat, she said with a smile. Now, see, I'll show you how to string them on a piece of grass to keep them from crushing. With a little pointed stick, Grandma Brown would make a tiny hole through a strawberry. Then through the hole she would put a long, thin grass. In this way she strung the berries on the grass stem, just as you string glass beads on a string. Then, when Bunny and Sue had a string of strawberries, they could sit in the shade and pull them off, eating them one by one. Oh, what fun this is, said Sue, when she could eat no more. Her hands and face were red with the juice of the strawberries. Yes, said Bunny, Grandpa's farm is the nicest place in the whole world, I think. And how good the strawberries tasted at the table when sugar was sprinkled over them, and covered with rich yellow cream from one of Grandpa's cows and with some of Grandma's bread covered with the golden yellow butter. Oh, dear, I'll just have to stop writing about it. I'll want to go to Grandpa Brown's farm myself and have some strawberries. And if I do that, I'll never get this book finished, I know. Anyhow, I'll just say that Bunny and Sue thought they had never tasted anything so good as those strawberries. And then the shortcake at supper that night. There I go again. Well, anyhow, it was the nicest cake you can imagine. Aren't you glad we came here, Sue? asked Bunny, when he had been given a second and very small piece of the strawberry shortcake. Oh, aren't I just, though, sighed Sue. The sun was shining brightly when Bunny Brown and his sister Sue awakened the next morning and went down to breakfast. What can we do today, Bunny? asked Sue. She always waited to see what Bunny was going to do before she began her play. Oh, I think we'll go over by the brook, he said. Fishing? No, Sue, not fishing. Mother won't let me have a regular fish hook. She's afraid I'll get it stuck in my hands, and you can't catch any fish on a bent pin hook, so we won't go fishing. I'm glad, Sue exclaimed, cause worms for bait is so squiggly in your hands. Over to the brook went the two children. Their mother had said they might play near it if they did not get wet, and they had on their old clothes. At first, after reaching the bank of the little brook, which rippled over green, mossy stones, Bunny and Sue had fun, just tossing in bits of wood and bark, making believe they were boats. Then Bunny thought of something. Oh, Sue, he cried, I'm going to make a waterfall. What's that? asked his sister. Well, you put some mud and sticks and stones in the brook all the way across. That makes a deep place, for the water can't run away. And after a while, the water runs over the pile of mud and stones and makes a waterfall. Will you help me build one? Yes, said Sue. Then take off your shoes and stockings, because we got to wade in the mud and water. And roll up your sleeves. We'll build a big waterfall. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Bunny Brown and his Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Turkey Gobbler. Bunny Brown had seen some of the older boys near his house build a sort of wall across a brook, so that the water was held back, making a little pond, and then, when the pond was full, the water ran over the top of the mud wall and down on the other side. That was why it was called a waterfall. Now I'll put some stones down first, Bunny explained to Sue. You get some pieces of grass with the dirt on the roots and put them on top of the stones. That's good to hold the water back. Shall I get wood, too? asked Sue. No, wood will only float away on top of the water, Bunny said. We have to have something that will sink, like stones and dirt. The two children were soon making the waterfall. They splashed about in the mud and water, but they did not mind, for they had taken off their shoes and stockings, though their mother had not said they could do so. But she wouldn't want us to go into the water with our shoes and stockings on, would she, Sue? asked Bunny. No, I guess not. So we'll have to take them off. That was all there was to do. The children rolled up their sleeves, for they had to reach down in the mud to get the stones and clumps of grass to make the waterfall. Pretty soon Bunny and Sue had built such a high wall of stones, mud, and grass across the little brook that no more water ran down the little stream. The water had gathered into a sort of pond that was getting larger all the while as it rose behind the stones. "'Oh, now it's running over!' cried Sue. Yes, now it's a waterfall. The water was trickling over the edge of the top of the wall. In a moment it ran down in quite a stream on the other side. If I only had a water wheel, the water would make it go around, said Bunny. Can't you make one? Sue wanted to know. She was always anxious to see something new and different. I guess water wheels are hard to make, Bunny said. But I'll ask Bunker Blue when we go home. Bunker Blue had also stayed on Grandpa's farm. He helped with the work, and he said he liked it almost as much as going out in boats or helping catch fish. But as they did not have a water wheel, and as Bunny could not make one there, the children had what fun they could. They floated sticks and bits of bark from the trees on the little pond that was made at the waterfall, and they watched the tiny boats sucked over the edge of the fall by the current. The fall was about a foot high, about as far as from Bunny's knee down to his toes. If we had a real boat, we could go for a ride on the pond, said Sue, for the water back of the fall looked like a little pond now, though of course it was not large enough for any boat bigger than a make-believe one. Maybe I could make a boat, Bunny answered. He began looking in the woods on either side of the brook for some boards, of which to make a boat, but of course he could not find any. I could make a raft like Robinson Crusoe did, if I could get some big pieces of trees, Bunny said to his sister. He tried to pull down to the water's edge some big tree branches that had been broken off in a storm, but he was not strong enough. Maybe we could fish in our pond, suggested Sue when she saw that her brother could not build a raft on which to go sailing. "'We haven't anything to fish with,' replied Bunny. "'And anyhow, I guess there wouldn't be any fish. They won't come where you play in the water. They're scared to come. But, oh, Sue, I know what we can do.' "'What?' "'We can go wading in the water. It's real nice and deep now.' "'Yes,' said Sue, as she looked at the pond of water back of the fall. "'It's deep, Bunny.' "'Oh, come on!' cried Bunny. "'I'll go in first, Sue, and show you how deep it is.' Bunny rolled up his little trousers as far above his knees as they would go. Then, taking a stick to poke in the water ahead of him, to make sure it was not too deep, he started to wade. "'Oh, Sue!' he cried. "'This is fun. Come on in.' "'I'm afraid I'll get my dress wet, Bunny.' "'Oh, come on!' Bunny cried. "'This is fun.' It's just like... Bunny suddenly stopped speaking, and a queer look came over his face. Oh, Sue, Sue, he cried. I'm sinking down in the mud. I, I can't pull my feet loose. Oh, dear, help me out, Sue. 
but Sue was not going to step into that deep-looking water, for if Bunny was stuck fast, she would be stuck too. I'm, I'm afraid, Bunny, she called to him, but I have to get out, Sue. I can't get out if you don't help me. Bunny tried to raise first one leg and then the other. Both were held fast in the sticky mud under the water. He almost fell over. He tried so hard to pull loose his feet. Oh, look out, cried Sue, as she saw her brother nearly fall. Oh, Sue, Sue, and Bunny was almost crying. What am I going to do? Will I have to stay here forever? Sue didn't know just what to answer, but finally she said, Wait, Bunny, I'll get a long stick and let you take hold of one end of it. I'll keep hold of the other end, and I'll stay here and pull you out. All right, but hurry up. I'm sinking down deeper all the while. Sue looked about on the bank of the stream until she found a long, thin branch from a tree where it had blown to the ground. She held one end of this branch out to her brother, and he took hold of it. Now I'll pull you out, cried Sue, as she held her end of the branch in both her hands. But instead of Sue pulling Bunny, it was Bunny who pulled Sue, as he was stronger than she was. Oh, look out, Bunny, look out, cried the little girl. I'll fall in. Yes, said Bunny, and he stopped pulling on the stick Sue held. I guess you will. But, oh, Sue, you'll have to help me. I'm sinking down more and more. And Bunny was. The water was nearly up to his trousers now. He was sinking down deeper in the mud. I'll go and tell Papa and Mama, Sue cried, as she threw down the tree branch and ran through the woods. They'll know how to get you out. Away ran Sue, but she did not go far before she met Bunker Blue. Well, he cried, I was just wondering where you were. Your mother sent me to look for you. Where's Bunny, Sue? Oh, he's sinking down in the mud. Sinking down in the mud? Why, what do you mean? Oh, hurry, Bunker Blue. Bunny made a waterfall, and then he went wading in it, and he can't get his feet out, and he most pulled me in, and he's scared, and so am I, and... And, but poor Sue could say no more. Well, well, cried Bunker. I don't know what it's all about, but show me where Bunny is. He took hold of Sue's hand and hurried back with her, and pretty soon Bunker saw Bunny in the middle of the little pond. Bunker did not stop to take off his shoes and stockings. Wading in with his shoes on, Bunker reached Bunny, who was just about to cry. In his strong arms, Bunker lifted Bunny up out of the mud and water and waded with him to dry land. There, now you're all right, he said. What did you do that for, Bunny? Well, we, we wanted to make a waterfall, and then we couldn't go sailing on it in a boat or on a raft, so I thought I'd go wading. I did wade, but I got stuck in the mud. I should say you did, replied Bunker looking at Bunny's bare, muddy feet and legs, and at his own dripping shoes and trousers. You sure did get stuck in the mud. It is better to keep out of these ditches and little brooks. The bottom is almost always soft mud, and you'll sink away down in it. Now go over there where the bottom is sandy. You won't sink there, and you can wash the mud off your legs. I'll have to wash, too, I guess." Bunker showed Bunny a shallow place in the brook, where there was no danger of sinking in the mud, and soon the little fellow was quite clean. His trousers were wet on the bottoms, but the sun and wind would soon dry them. Bunny and Sue were telling Bunker how they had built the waterfall when they heard a rustling in the bushes, and a noise as if someone or something were coming nearer. "'I guess it's our dog Splash,' said Bunny." No, Splash was asleep in the barn when I came to look for you, said Bunker. And then through the trees came a man. Hello, children, he cried. Oh, ho, so this is the trouble, eh? He went on. I wondered why no water was running down into my chicken yard, and I came to see what had stopped up my brook. It's your waterfall. Y yes, I made it, Bunny said, wondering whether he had done something wrong. And he got stuck in the mud, added Sue. She always wanted to tell everything. 
"'Yes, this mud is pretty sticky,' remarked the man. "'But if you are done playing waterfall, I guess I'll just take it away. "'You see, it stops the water from coming down the brook. "'That is, it stops nearly all of it, and I need the water.' "'With a long stick, the man began poking away the mud and stones "'Bunny and Sue had piled up to make the waterfall. "'This little brook goes right through my chicken yard,' the man explained and the chickens like to drink the water. When I saw, a while ago, that there was only a little coming down, not enough for the hens and roosters to drink, I thought something had happened, and it was you children who did it all, and the man smiled. Well, I know you want to have fun, but please don't stop up my brook any more, will you? he asked. No, sir, answered Bunny. He had had enough of waterfalls, for a while at least. And he and Sue went back to Grandpa's. Oh, Bunny, Bunny, was all his mother said when she heard what had happened. What will you and Sue do next? I don't know, Mother, Bunny answered. Two days after that, Bunny and Sue, nicely washed and combed, with Sue wearing her new red dress, started for the next farmhouse to play with a little boy and girl who lived in it. They went across the fields. Sue stopped to pick some flowers while Bunny went on ahead. Pretty soon he heard his little sister calling, Oh, Bunny, Bunny, come quick, he's after me. Bunny turned, thinking it might be a goat running after his sister, as one had done, though it did not hurt Sue. But this time it was no goat. Bunny saw a big bird with his wings dragging along on the ground, his feathers all puffed up, and with what looked like a red tassel hanging, dangling dangling down over his beak, strutting toward Sue. "'Oh, Bunny, Bunny, what is it?' Sue cried. "'Take him away!' "'It's a big turkey gobbler,' said Bunny. "'I'll drive him away for you, Sue. Don't be afraid.' "'Gobble, obble, obble!' cried the turkey. But of course Bunny Brown and his sister Sue did not know what the gobbler was saying. "'Oh, take him away, Bunny, take him away!' cried the little girl dancing up and down, her red dress fluttering in the wind. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of Bunny Brown and his sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. Lost in the Woods Bunny Brown did not just know how he was going to drive the angry turkey gobbler away from his sister Sue. He did not stop to think of that, but, like the brave little fellow he was, he ran toward Sue, ready to do something. The gobbler was closer to Sue now. "'I've got to drive him away! I've got to drive him away!' said Bunny to himself over and over again. "'Oh, Bunny! Bunny!' cried Sue. "'Take him away! Take him away!' This would have been hard for Bunny to do, for the gobbler was a very big one, and Bunny could never in the world have lifted him. I wish my dog Splash were here, thought Bunny. He'd make that old gobbler run. But Splash was not there. He had run off down the road with another dog, just before Bunny Brown and his sister Sue set off together. Gobble, obble, obble, cried the turkey. He spread out his wings wider than ever and the red thing that hung down over his nose, as Sue called his beak, seemed to stand up straight. He was so angry. Oh, Bunny! And Sue was screaming now. Help me, Bunny! And then all at once Bunny thought of something. In his hand he carried a tin pail, which he and Sue had hoped to fill with wild strawberries on their way back from playing with the children in the next house. Raising this pail over his head, Bunny threw it as straight as he could at the gobbler, and, to Bunny's surprise, the pail went right over the turkey's head. It caught by the wire handle around the gobbler's neck, and hung in such a way that the gobbler could no longer see Sue in her red dress, and I think the little girl's red dress made the gobbler more angry than he would otherwise have been. Gobblers don't like red for some reason or other. "'Gobble, obble, obble!' called the big turkey. Oh, but he must have been surprised. He did not know what to do. He just danced around and around, trying to shake the pail off his neck. 
if he had only lowered his head, as he did when picking up corn, the pail would have slid off, but the gobbler did not think of that. Perhaps he still thought he could find Sue and pick her legs with his sharp beak, because she wore a red dress that he did not like. And it was such a pretty red dress, too, and Sue looked so nice in it. Gobble, obble, obble, went the turkey louder than ever. Oh, bunny, bunny, cried Sue, as she ran toward her brother. What did you do to him? I, I tried to hit him with the pail to make him let you alone, said Bunny, but the pail went on his neck. Wasn't I a good shot, Sue? Yes, she said, and now let's run before he comes after us again. Run, Bunny, run. But I, I want my pail, Bunny said, holding back. The turkey has my pail and we can't get any strawberries. But though Sue was younger than Bunny, she knew it would never do to try and take the pail away from the turkey now. You can't get it, Bunny, she said. If you take it away from him, he'll bite you. Sides, when he has it on him that way, it's just like the blinkers on a horse. He can't see us. Come on. What Sue said was true. The turkey could not see the children as long as the pail was on his neck in that way. When he drops it off, we can come back and get it. Maybe when he has gone to bed, Bunny, said Sue. Turkeys go to bed early, don't they? Maybe, answered her brother. He knew chickens went to bed, or to roost, as it is called, quite early, and a turkey, after all, was like a big chicken, or rooster. Well, when he goes to bed, we'll come and get the pail, said Sue. Only we can't get any strawberries then, because it'll be dark. All right, agreed Bunny, as he hurried across the field with Sue. We'll let him have the pail for a while. It seemed the only thing to do, as the turkey was waltzing, dancing, and strutting about, with the pail still on his neck, making his funny noise. Gobble, obble, obble. He did not try to find Sue and her red dress, or even Bunny now. Probably the gobbler was trying to get the pail off his head. And just as Bunny and Sue reached the fence and crawled through to the road where the gobbler could not get them, the big turkey did manage to get rid of the pail. He put his head down, and the pail handle slipped over his neck. Then, with a loud gobble, he ran toward Bunny and Sue, but they were safe on the other side of the fence by this time. "'Oh, Bunny, I'm so glad,' said Sue. "'It's a good thing you had that pail with you.' "'Well, if I couldn't throw that at him, I could throw a stone,' said Bunny. "'But I think the pail was just the very best thing the little boy could have thrown at the gobbler. Besides, it did not hurt him, as a stone might have done. Looking back to see where the pail lay, Bunny went on with Sue to the house, where they were to spend the afternoon. They found their little friends waiting for them, and after telling about the turkey, the children had fine fun. That was Mr. North's turkey, said Gladys Parker, one of the little girls. He's real mean, that turkey is, and chases everybody. Well, he chased me, said Sue, only Bunny made him stop. I'm glad you did, said Ethel Burke. Maybe he'll be a better gobbler after this. The children played many games. They had fun in the swing, and Mrs. Parker gave them all some milk and cookies for lunch. When it came time for Bunny and Sue to go home, they went past the field where the gobbler had been. He was not there now, as the children found after looking carefully about. Maybe he had gone to bed, for it was about time for the chickens to go to roost. Turkeys like to roost in trees, you know, and not in a coop as chickens do. And perhaps the big gobbler was, even then, perched up in some tree with his head under his wing. And for all I know, perhaps he was dreaming of a little girl in a red dress and a boy who threw a pail over a turkey's head. That is, if gobblers do dream. Oh, there's the pail, cried Bunny, as he saw the shining tin in the middle of the field. I'm going to get it, Sue. And Bunny did. It was too late then to pick any of the wild strawberries, but Bunny and Sue knew they could come some other time. They reached home safely and told about the gobbler. My, exclaimed Grandma Brown, but that was quite an adventure, Bunny and Sue. Oh, we have lots of them, said Bunny, don't we, Sue? Yes, Bunny, but I don't like turkey adventures. 
The next day the two children went after wild strawberries. Grandpa Brown told them of a place, not far from the house, on a little hill, where many berries grew. And you won't have to go near the turkey to get there, either, he said, though I see you haven't your red dress on, Sue. So even if the gobbler did see you, I don't believe he would chase you this time. I only wear my red dress when I go visiting, said Sue, but I'm not going to visit turkey gobblers any more. Bunny and Sue found many berries on the hill their grandpa had told them about, and soon their pail was half full. A little way off were some woods, but before one came to the place where the trees grew thick, with green moss beneath them, there was a field, and in this field Bunny saw some bushes, with deep purple berries growing on them. "'Oh, Sue!' he cried. "'Let's pick some raspberries. There's lots on those bushes, and Grandma can make raspberry jam and put it in tarts, like Aunt Lou did. Let's pick raspberries. We've got enough strawberries.' "'All right,' answered Sue, for she was always ready to do what Bunny wanted her to. The two children were soon in the field picking the purple raspberries. They walked on and on from one bush to another, and by the time their pail was full, with the raspberries on top of the strawberries, they were close to the woods. "'Let's go in and rest in the shade,' Sue said. "'I'm awful tired and hot, Bunny.' "'All right, we'll go in.' And in they went. It was nice and cool beneath the trees and the children found a spring of water where they had a drink, for they were thirsty. "'And I'm hungry, too,' said Sue, after a bit. "'Bunny, do you suppose we could eat some of the berries? We can pick more before we go home.' "'Yes, we'll eat some, Sue.' Seated on the green moss in the shade of a tree, Bunny and Sue ate the berries, getting their faces and hands stained red and purple. "'But we can wash in the spring before we go home,' Sue said, "'so it will be all right.' "'Yes,' agreed Bunny. "'After resting a while, the children washed at the spring and took another drink. "'Then they saw a big frog hopping along. "'He must have been having a bath in the spring, "'which was almost as large as a wash-tub. "'Let's see if we can catch that frog,' cried Bunny. "'We won't hurt him, though.' "'So he and Sue followed the frog. "'But the frog was a good jumper.' and led the children quite a chase. And then, just when Bunny thought he was going to put his hands on him, the big green fellow found another spring, and into that he went with a splash, grunting as he did so. Krug, krug. Oh, he's gone, cried Sue, quite sadly. Never mind, replied Bunny, we'll find another. But they did not, though they waited around the second spring for some time. "'I guess we'd better go home,' said Bunny. "'Yes,' agreed Sue, looking around at the trees on every side of them. The children started, but going home was not as easy as it seemed. They walked on and on, and soon Sue began to get tired. "'Aren't we at the place where we picked the berries?' she asked after a bit. "'Almost,' answered Bunny. But though he looked and looked through the trees, he could not see the field and the little hill that was not far from Grandpa Brown's house. The children went on a little farther, until all at once Bunny stumbled over a stone and fell. The pail flew from his hand, and the berries spilled all over the ground. "'Oh, dear!' cried Sue. Then she added quickly, "'But I'll help you pick them up, Bunny.' Bunny sat up and rubbed his knee. He wrinkled up his nose in a funny way. "'Does it hurt?' asked Sue. My leg does a little, but not my nose, Bunny said, and then he laughed. The children picked up the scattered berries. Their pail was only half full now, for they could not find all the berries that had spilled. We'll have to pick a lot more, remarked Sue. Yes, said Bunny, we will when we find the bushes. On they went again, but it seemed that they would never get out of the woods. After a while, Bunny stopped sat down on a log and said, Sue, I know what's the matter. What? asked the little girl. Does your leg hurt? Is that what's the matter? No, answered Bunny. The matter is, we're lost. That's why we can't find the berry bushes. We're lost, Sue. End of chapter 14
Chapter Fifteen of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Old Hermit. Bunny Brown and his sister Sue had been lost before several times. Maybe that is why Sue was not so frightened now when Bunny spoke as he did. As for the little boy, he seemed more tired than worried. "'Yes, Sue,' he said again, "'I guess we're lost. "'I've looked all over, and I can't see the hill "'where we picked the strawberries, "'nor the field where we got the raspberries. "'I can't either,' said Sue. "'And I wish we had some berries, Bunny. "'Why? "'Cause I'm hungry right now again. "'Well, you can eat these, Sue. "'I don't want them. "'Bunny Brown was hungry himself, "'and he did want some of the berries very much.' but there were now only a few left in the pail, and Bunny remembered that his mother had said to him that he must always look after Sue when she went walking with him. And the best way he could look after her this time, he thought, like the brave little fellow he tried to be, was to give her all the berries. "'Are you sure you don't want em, Bunny?' asked his sister. "'Sure,' he said. "'Anyhow, we'll find more when I get hungry.' "'All right.' and Sue began eating the berries. She was very hungry. After a while, Bunny said, Now I'm going to look for the field again. If we find the field, we can find the hill, and then we'll be almost home. All right, replied Sue, putting the last of the berries into her mouth. Do I have to wash again, Bunny? she asked, as she looked at her stained hands. Her mouth was stained too, but she could not see that. I don't know where the spring of water is, Bunny said so I don't see how you can wash. All right. Sue did not much mind. She was not very fond of washing in cold spring water anyhow. Once more the children went on, but though they followed many paths through the woods, they did not get on the one that led out and to the field and hill. Oh, dear, said Sue in a sad little voice. What's the matter? asked Bunny, stopping and turning around, for he had walked on ahead. I'm so tired, Bunny. Well, we'll rest a while. They sat down on a log. Bunny looked through the trees here and there, thinking he might see some path that led out of the woods, but he saw none. Are you rested now, Sue? he asked after a while. A little, she answered. I can walk some more. So they went on again. It was getting late afternoon now, for the children had not started to pick berries until after dinner. The sun was going down, and of course it was darker in the woods, with all the trees around, than it was out in the open fields. Bunny Brown and his sister Sue were surely lost in the woods, and they did not know how to get home. As I have told you, this was not the first time this had happened to them, and they were not as frightened as they had been other times, but still it was no fun. Through the woods were many paths. Some had been made by cows or horses, perhaps, while others were those taken by persons who walked among the trees, but there were no persons now in the woods. That is, Bunny and Sue could see none. All at once Bunny gave a yell. Hoo! 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 he cried as loudly as he could. Oh! cried Sue. What's the matter, Bunny? Did a snake bite you or a mud turtle? Nope. I was just hollering so someone would hear me. What for? Sue wanted to know. So they would come and take us out of the woods. Oh, and Sue laughed again. I'll holler too, she said. So she did. Then Bunny called again, and he and Sue called together as loudly as they could. But no one answered them. All they could hear was an echo, the sound of their own voices coming back to them, bouncing like a rubber ball. They had heard that before, so they knew what an echo was. But an echo only repeats the same things that are said. It does not help to find the way out of the woods, and Bunny and Sue were still lost. They went on farther, but they did not know whether they were going toward home or away from it. Sue, in spite of brave little Bunny, was beginning to get frightened now. Tears came into her eyes, though they did not fall. I'm, I'm so tired, Bunny, she said. I want to go home. So do I, Sue, but we've got to get on the right path, and I can't find it. Let's try this one, said the little girl, 
as they came to a place where there were two paths through the woods. One went off toward the left side, and the other to the right. "'I'll take one path,' said Bunny, "'and you can take the other, Sue.' "'Oh, no!' "'Why not? "'Cause then we'd both be lost.' "'Well, we're both lost now.' "'Yes,' said Sue, "'I know. "'But now we're both lost together. "'But if we were lost all alone, "'I'd be scareder than I am now. "'Don't go away, Bunny.' "'I won't. "'But which path shall we take?' "'Sue thought for a minute. "'Then she tried a little game "'that the children sometimes played. "'Shutting her eyes, "'Sue pointed her fat little hand first at one path and then the other, while she said, My mother told me to take this one. And she moved her hand back and forth, pointing first at one path and then at the other. When she said the last word, one, her hand was pointing at the left-hand path. We'll take this one, Bunny, she said. All right, Sue, maybe this one will take us home. So they walked on and on, but Sue's guess had not been a very good one, even though she had played her queer little game. She and Bunny were deeper in the woods than ever. "'Oh, dear!' cried the little girl. "'I've just got to sit down, Bunny. My legs is so tired.' "'Mine is, too,' Bunny said, too weary to speak more properly. "'We'll both rest, Sue, and then we'll holler some more.' "'And what will we do if nobody comes to get us?' "'We'll go back and take the other path, Sue. Maybe we came on the wrong one.' Maybe we did. Sue was glad to have the other path to think about. Perhaps that might be the one that would lead them home. She and Bunny sat on a log to rest, and then once more Bunny gave a loud shout. Hello, hello, he cried. We're lost. Somebody come and find us. Sue joined in, crying in her shrill little voice, but for a while no one answered. "'Well, we'll go back and take the other path,' said Bunny. He was getting very hungry, and he wished he would come to another place where strawberries or raspberries grew. Before starting back, however, Bunny gave one more shout. "'Hello! Hello!' he cried. To the surprise of himself and Sue, there was an answer. "'Hello! Hello!' Bunny and Sue looked at one another. "'Did, did you hear that?' asked Bunny in a whisper. Yes, answered Sue, it was the echo. But as they waited, the call came again. Hello, hello, who are you? Where are you? What do you want? That wasn't any echo, said Bunny, because we didn't speak. It's somebody after us, Sue. Oh, I'm so glad. So am I. There was a crackling of the bushes, and through the trees came walking an old man with long white hair and a beard. He had a kind face, and Bunny and Sue liked him at once. "'Oh, did you come for us?' asked Bunny. "'Well, no, not exactly,' the man answered with a smile. "'I heard you calling, though. What is the matter?' "'We're lost,' replied Sue. "'Will you please take us home?' "'I would, if I knew where your home was, little girl.' "'Do you live in the woods?' Bunny asked. The man looked as though his home might be in some hollow tree." or woodland cave. Yes, boy, I live here. All alone, asked Sue, looking around. All alone, yes, little girl. I'm a sort of hermit, I suppose. At least folks call me that, and hermits always live alone, you know. The man smiled very kindly at the children. Well, Mr. Hermit, said Sue, please take us home, and give me and Bunny something to eat. We're awful hungry. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. Looking for the Horses Once again the hermit smiled at the children. I can give you something to eat, he said, for I have that, though I do live in the woods. But I do not know whether I can take you to your home. Where do you live? "'We live in Belmere near the ocean,' said Sue. "'The hermit shook his gray head. "'That is very far from here,' he said. "'I do not believe I could find the place. "'I have not been out of these woods for many years. 
except to go to the village. But how did you get so far from home? Oh, we came to see our grandpa, explained Bunny. And what is his name? Grandpa Brown, exclaimed Sue. And he's awful nice. Grandma Brown is nice, too, and she gives us cookies and milk. Can you give us cookies and milk, Mr. Hermit? Well, I can give you some milk, answered the old man of the woods, but I have no cookies. I have bread, though. Bread and milk is good, said Bunny with a sigh. He was hungry enough to be glad of even some bread without the milk, but he was glad the hermit had milk. Where is your house? asked Sue. It isn't what you would call a house, said the old man. It is a sort of log cabin. I built most of it myself, but it is over there through the trees, and he pointed behind him. I can't see it, said Sue, standing up and looking through the trees. It's there just the same, and the hermit smiled again. Please take us there, give us some bread and milk, and then take us to Grandpa Brown's house, said Sue. We're staying there, and so is our papa and mamma. And so is Bunker Blue, put in Bunny. Do you know Bunker Blue, Mr. Hermit? No, I can't say that I do. And the old man shook his head. But I know your grandfather, Mr. Brown. I can take you to his farm, though it is quite a way off. You must have wandered far. We were picking berries and we got lost, Bunny explained. But we don't mind now if you'll give us some bread and milk and take us to Grandpa's. Well, I can do that for you and the old man smiled again at the two children. Come, he said, and he held out a hand to each of them. Bunny and Sue toddled along. They were quite happy now. They did not stop to think that their parents and their grandparents might be worried, for it was quite late. Bunny and Sue did not often worry. They just let things happen the way they would. Here's my house, said the hermit, after he had gone along a winding path. He pointed to a log cabin amid the trees. Oh, that's nice, exclaimed Bunny. It's like a playhouse, cried Sue. Don't you wish we had that, Bunny? Yes, I do. But we couldn't have it, could we? And he looked up into the face of the hermit. No, I'm afraid not, little boy. I need it to live in and to keep the rain and snow from me. Oh, do you stay here in the winter? asked Sue, surprised. Yes. Isn't it cold? Sometimes, but I have a fireplace, and I pile on logs and make a hot fire. Then I am warm. I'd like it here in winter, said Bunny. Do you slide downhill, Mr. Hermit? No, I'm too old for that, little boy. But come in now, and I'll give you something to eat. Then I'll take you home. I'll try and get you there before dark, so your folks won't be worried. They may be out hunting for you now. They always look for us when we get lost, said Sue. But we didn't know we were going to get lost this time, added Bunny. The hermit set out two plates with some slices of bread on them. Then from down in his spring, where he kept it cool, he brought a pail of milk. Soon Bunny and Sue were eating a nice little supper. It was lighter in the log cabin than it had been in the woods, for the trees were cut down around the hermit's home. Oh, Bunny, exclaimed Sue, as she drank the last of her milk. Oh, Bunny, we forgot to look for them. Look for what, Bunny wanted to know, as he crumbled some more bread into his bowl of milk. What did we forget to look for, Sue? Grandpa's horses. The gypsies took them and didn't bring them back, she explained, so the hermit would know what she and Bunny were talking about. The gypsies took your grandpa's horses, little girl? Yes, they borrowed them, Grandpa says, but they didn't bring them back. I guess maybe the gypsies got lost, Bunny, and that's why they didn't bring the horses back. But we looked all over and we couldn't find them, Mr. Hermit. I almost found one, said Bunny. It was a horse walking along the road, but it wasn't Grandpa's. And a cow tickled Bunker Blue in the ribs when he was sleeping under our automobile, Sue explained. I mean, Bunker was sleeping, not the cow. The cow was eating grass, she was, and her horns tickled Bunker. The hermit shook his head. You are queer children, he said, but tell me about your grandpa's horses. Between them, one telling part and the other helping, Bunny and Sue told the story 
of the gypsies taking Grandpa Brown's best team of horses. And we've looked and looked, but we can't find them, said Sue. Once Bunny found Aunt Lou's diamond ring that was lost. It was in the lobster claw all the while, and we didn't know it. But we forgot to look for the horses today, said Bunny. You didn't see them, did you, Mr. Hermit? Well, now I don't know about that, said the old man, who lived all alone in the woods. Come to think of it, I did see a camp of gypsies in the woods, not far from here the other day. I was out taking a walk, as I often do, and down in a little valley I saw something shining. Oh, I know what it was, cried Bunny, his eyes bright with eagerness. What was it? asked the hermit. You saw the looking-glasses on the gypsy wagons, shining in the sun. That was it, little man, but how did you know? Cause Sue and I saw it too once. It was when we came in the big automobile. We went to the gypsy camp, and we most got lost then, but Mamma and Papa and our dog Splash found us. What a queer name for a dog, said the hermit. We called him that cause he splashed into the water and pulled me out when I fell in. The time Bunny and me were shipwrecked, said Sue. We got shipwrecked on an island. Like Robinson Crusoe, added the little boy. But we couldn't find Mr. Friday, said Sue. You could be Mr. Friday if we ever played Robinson Crusoe, couldn't he, Bunny? Sue asked. You look like the pictures of Robinson in the book. You could be him, and Bunny could be Friday. That would be better. Would you like to, Mr. Hermit? Well, I don't know, my dear. I guess my play days and make-believe days are over. You are just like Robinson Crusoe, Sue went on. It's better to be him, cause Mr. Friday is black. You'd have to black up. I did, with black mud, and I was washing it off when I fell in and Splash pulled me out. You can tell me about that another time, said the old man. I think now I had better start home with you, and, on the way, we will look in the valley for the gypsies. Perhaps they are there yet. And maybe they have Grandpa's horses, cried Bunny. Oh, wouldn't that be good, Sue, if we could find them? It would be just lovely. Well, it's possible these may be the same gypsies, said the old man, though they may not be, and they may not have your Grandpa's horses. But we'll look anyhow. So they set out to look for the missing horses. Bunny and Sue were not lost any more, for they felt sure the hermit would take them home to Grandpa's house. End of chapter 16、Chapter、Seventeen of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. In the storm. Say, Mr. Hermit, said Bunny, as he and his sister Sue walked along with a nice but strange man who lived in the log cabin in the woods. Is it far to where Grandpa's horses are, Mr. Hermit? Well, little man, I'm not sure we can find your grandfather's horses, said the aged man with a smile at the two children. All I know is that I saw some gypsies camped over in the valley. It may be that they are the ones your grandfather is looking for. Would you know the horses if you saw them? I would, exclaimed Sue. One of em has an awful nice long tail. The hermit laughed. I fear that wouldn't be a very good way of telling your grandfather's horses from any others, said the old man. Many horses have long tails. But if there are some gypsies camping in the valley, you could tell your folks, and your grandfather can come. And see if they have his horses. Is it very far? asked Bunny again. He was not as tired as before he had eaten the bread and milk, but still he did not want to walk any more than he had to. Sue also looked weary. Oh, no, it isn't far, the hermit said. It's only a little way to the valley, but it is quite a long way to your grandfather's house. I don't know whether you can walk it or not. I'm tired, said Sue. I want to ride. I'm sorry I haven't anything to give you a ride on, returned the old man. I can carry you, though, little girl, if your brother can walk. I can walk, said Bunny. His fat little legs were tired, but he was not going to say so. All right, then I'll carry your sister. Piggyback, Sue asked. Will you give me a piggyback? That's the way my papa carries me. 
"'Yes, I'll take you, Pickaback," said the hermit, and he almost whispered. Bunny, who was looking at him, was sure he saw tears in the old man's eyes, or was it a drop of rain? For there were clouds in the sky now, and it seemed as if it was going to storm. The old man looked around. He saw a flat stump not far away, and up on this he lifted Sue. "'Now you can get up on my back from there,' he said and I will carry you so you won't be tired any more, little girl. That's good, murmured Sue rather sleepily, as she cuddled her head down on the hermit's shoulder. You know how to make a nice piggyback, she went on. Did you ever ride your little girl this way? Yes, said the old man. Once I had a little girl just like you, and I used to ride her this way. Where is your little girl? Sue asked. She is up there and the old man pointed to the sky. This time Bunny was sure the hermit had tears in his eyes. But a little later Bunny was not quite sure, for he felt a drop of something wet on his own cheek. "'Why, it's raining!' he exclaimed. "'It's raining water!' "'So it is, I do believe,' said the hermit. He stopped, still holding Sue on his back, and lifted up his face. He felt several drops from the clouds, and then there came a pattering on the leaves of the trees. It was getting quite dark now. There were many clouds in the sky, and every now and then a flash of lightning could be seen. Off in the west there was a rumble of thunder. Oh, cried Sue, I want to go home. I don't want to be out in the storm. I like the rain, said Bunny, but I don't like the thunder and lightning. Do you, Mr. Hermit? I don't mind them very much, answered the old man. "'But if you are afraid, I'll take you back to my cabin "'and leave you there while I go to your house "'and get them to come for you in a carriage.' "'I like to ride in a carriage,' said Sue, "'though you gave me a nice piggyback, too. "'But I like a carriage and horses. "'Well, then, that's what I'll do. "'I think it is going to rain hard soon, "'and if I carried you through it, you'd get wet. "'So we'll go back, and I'll see about the horse and carriage.' "'But can't we go and get Grandpa's horses from the gypsies?' asked Bunny. "'I'm afraid not this time,' answered the old man. "'If the gypsies are in the valley, they will stay all night anyhow, "'and we can look for the horses in the morning, when it has stopped raining. "'We'll go back to my house now.' "'By this time the rain was coming down quite hard. "'But as they walked along under the trees, "'Bunny and Sue did not get very wet, nor did the hermit.' Sue was almost asleep, she was so tired, and Bunny was glad they did not have to walk all the way back to Grandpa's farm. It was nearly night, and Bunny thought his father and mother, as well as the others, might be worrying about him and Sue, but then the hermit would soon go and tell them that the children were safe in his log cabin. Back through the woods they went. Now it lightened very often, and it thundered so loudly that Sue awakened on the back of the hermit and began to cry. I want to go home, she sobbed. I want my mamma. I'll get her as soon as I can, said the old man. Don't cry, little girl. The thunder is only a big noise, like Fourth of July, and the lightning is only a great big firefly. That is make-believe, you know. Oh, yes, let's pretend that way, cried Bunny, for he was not as frightened at the storm as was Sue. She stopped crying. Sue always liked anything make-believe, even if it had to do with thunder and lightning. "'And will you get a carriage and ride me and Bunny home?' she asked. "'Yes,' answered the hermit. "'All right, then I won't be afraid.' Once more she cuddled her head down on the hermit's shoulder. In a little while they were back at his cabin. The aged man went in and lighted a lamp, for it was quite dark. It was now raining hard, and the stormy wind was blowing the tree branches all about. "'Now you stay right here until I come back with your father or grandfather,' said the hermit, as he put on an old coat to go out in the rain. "'Aren't you got an umbrella?' asked Sue. "'I don't need one, little girl. Umbrellas aren't much good in the woods. They catch on the trees. I'll be all right. I don't mind getting wet. Now don't you go away. I can't take you with me, or I would, but you'll be all right here.' "'We're not afraid,' said Bunny bravely. "'Once we got locked in an empty house, didn't we, Sue?' "'Yup, and we slided down the banister rail. It was fun.' "'Well, I haven't any banister here for you to slide down,' said the hermit, 
but you may go to sleep if you like. He went out, shutting the door after him, first having put the lamp on a high shelf where it could not be knocked over if Bunny and Sue happened to be playing about the cabin. But Bunny and Sue did not feel much like playing. They were not so frightened by the storm just now, but they were tired and sleepy. Sue saw in one corner of the room a sort of bed or bunk with blankets and pillows spread out on it. Oh, Bunny, cried the little girl, there's a bed just like those in our automobile. I'm going to sleep. All right, answered Bunny. You go to sleep and I'll sit up and be on guard like the soldiers do in camp. I'll pretend I'm a soldier. That will be fun, exclaimed Sue. She climbed up in the hermit's bed and put her head down on the pillow. It was a nice clean bunk, as clean as those her mother had made in the traveling automobile. Bunny curled up in a chair near Sue. His eyes were wide open, and he tried to feel just as he thought a soldier on guard would feel. His mother had read him stories about soldiers staying awake all night. Bunny was not sure he could do this. But I won't go to sleep until the hermit man comes back with Papa or Grandpa Brown, he thought. Then Sue and I can go to sleep in the carriage. The rain came pattering down on the log cabin roof. Bunny could not see the lightning now because of the lamp which the hermit had lighted. But he could hear the thunder. It did not frighten him, though. Sometimes, when it sounded very loud, the little boy pretended it was a big circus wagon rumbling over a bridge. The tank wagon with water in it, where the big hippopotamus splashed about. The circus wagon, Bunny was sure, would make the most noise, so he made believe. Sue was curled up on the bed. Once she roused up enough to say, Bunny? Yes, Sue, he answered. What do you want? Are you there, Bunny? she asked sleepily. Yes, Sue, I'm right here. He reached over and touched her hand. What do you want, Sue? I, I just wanted to know. Are you there? And with that, Sue turned over again and soon was fast, fast asleep. Several times Bunny felt himself nodding. His head would bob down and his eyes slowly go shut. Then he would rouse up and say to himself, Soldiers mustn't sleep when they are guarding the camp. I'm a make-believe soldier and I mustn't sleep. Then he would be wide awake for a little while, but soon his head would nod again, and finally Bunny slept just as Sue was doing, only he was asleep in the chair, and she was in the hermit's bed. Just how long he slept Bunny did not know, but all at once he was awakened by a noise at the door. At first he thought it was the hermit who had come back with his papa or mamma, but then, instead of a knock, a scratching sound was heard. Then Sue awoke and heard it, too. Scratch went something on the door. Oh, Bunny, what is it? asked Sue, sitting up in bed. What is it, Bunny? End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Picnic. Bunny Brown did not answer his sister Sue right away. He was listening to the queer scratching sound. He wanted to try and think what it was. Scratch, scratch, scratch it went. Oh, Bunny, cried Sue, rolling over in the bunk, so she could easily slip over the edge and be nearer to her brother. It's something trying to get in. Yes, said Bunny, it does sound like that. Maybe, maybe it's a wolf, Bunny. Bunny looked at the door and windows to make sure they were closed. There aren't any wolves up here, he said, shaking his head. How do you know, Sue asked. Because I asked Grandpa Brown if there were any bears, and he said there wasn't any, not a one, and wolves are always where bears are. So if there aren't any bears, there aren't any wolves, Sue. Maybe, said Sue. But what is it scratching at the door, Bunny? I don't know, Sue. I could open it and look out, shall I? No, she cried, for if you open the door, it would come in. Now it can't get in or else it would. It can only scratch. Bunny thought it would be best not to open the door, 
but what could that queer noise be he wished he knew again it sounded scratch 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 and then all at once there came a bark both bunny and sue cried out at the same time a dog and bunny added oh i guess it's splash i'll let him in he ran to the door and opened it for it was not locked and a second later in bounded good old splash the big dog he was all wet with the rain but oh how glad he was to see bunny and sue he barked and jumped all over the cabin getting the children wet from his dripping coat but bunny and sue did not mind that they were so glad to see splash and i i thought you were a wolf laughed sue putting her arms around the neck of splash sue was wide awake now i wonder how he got here questioned bunny maybe he ran on ahead of the folks they must be coming for us now i think splash just came by himself said sue and that was what had happened bunny and sue listened but they did not hear their father or mother or the hermit coming along it was still raining but the thunder and lightning had stopped the children were glad of that splash just came off by himself and found us just as he did lots of times before said sue didn't you doggy she asked splash barked and that might have meant yes or no bunny and sue did not know dog language and i don't either so i can't tell you but anyhow splash was there and bunny and sue were very glad it was not at all lonesome in the hermit's cabin now there was no clock so bunny did not know how late it was though he could have told time had there been a clock after shaking some of the water from his shaggy coat sending it in a shower over bunny and sue and about the cabin splash lay down on the rug and seemed quite happy he looked from bunny to sue and then put his head out on his paws as if to go to sleep it was as if he said well everything's all right now i'm here with you you can go to sleep just as i'm doing but bunny and sue were not so sleepy now they were glad splash had come but they also wanted their papa and mamma and their own little beds at grandpa's house they were glad splash had come but they also wanted their papa and mamma and their own little beds at grandpa's house i i wish they would come for us said sue after a bit so do i returned bunny it must be most morning the children talked for a while they did not feel very happy though bunny tried to get sue to play some make-believe games i don't want to she said i want to go home all at once splash who had been asleep sprang up and began to bark loudly oh dear cried sue who had fallen into a little sleep what is it bunny splash barked so loudly that bunny could not make his voice heard the dog ran to the door and scratched at it as he had done before he wants to go out said sue it's somebody coming for us bunny cried i guess it's papa and mamma he opened the door out bounded splash barking joyously then a voice cried bunny sue are you all right yes daddy cried bunny well well what a scare you gave us said another voice but we didn't mean to grandpa called sue for she heard her grandpa's voice is it is it most morning bunny asked only a little after nine answered his grandpa it isn't late grandpa brown took sue in his arms and papa brown carried bunny splash ran along by himself no one had to carry him mr brown thanked the hermit for his care of the children during the storm and then through the rain that was falling gently now bunny and sue were taken out to the carriage which was in the road at the edge of the woods a little later they were on their way to the farmhouse splash running along beside the carriage can splash see his way in the dark sleepily asked bunny i think so answered papa brown anyhow we haven't any room for him in the carriage how did you get lost this time it was the frog that made us said bunny we chased after him and we couldn't find the right path again but the man found us and oh how glad mamma and grandma brown were to see the children when they came home don't you ever get lost again said mamma brown as she undressed sue for bed no ma'am we won't promised the little girl and bunny said the same thing 
the family had become very much worried when bunny and sue did not come back from having gone for berries supper time came and no children then grandpa brown his hired men mr and mrs brown grandma brown and even bunker blue began to look for the lost ones they did not find bunny and sue of course for they were far away with the kind hermit then the storm came and the family at the farmhouse were more worried than ever they did not know what to do but everything was all right when the hermit came along through the storm and said he had found the children then grandpa brown hitched up a horse to a big carriage and he and papa brown taking the hermit with them went to the cabin before that though splash had gone off by himself and had found bunny and sue then along came papa and grandpa brown and that ended the little adventure everything was all right he's a nice man that hermit said sue he gave me a piggyback and once he had a little girl of his own but she is in the sky now yes he is a good old man said grandpa brown i know him though he hardly ever comes to see me he has lived in his cabin in the woods all alone for many years once he had a wife and children but they all died and he became very sad so he went to live by himself he hardly ever speaks to any one but he loves children bunny and sue could not have been cared for by any one better than old mr wright the hermit and he knows where the gypsies are that have your horses grandpa said bunny that was not just what the hermit had said but it was as near as bunny could remember grandpa brown shook his head i'm afraid i'll never see my horses again he said but i'll ask mr wright where the gypsies that he saw are camping then i'll have a look for my horses this grandpa brown did next day he went over to the hermit's cabin taking with him a nice basket of good things to eat that grandma and mrs brown had put up the children ate his bread and milk said mother brown so we must give him something else in place of it and i think mr wright the hermit was very glad to get the basket of good things for of course a man living all alone in the woods cannot make pies and jam tarts and cake as good as mothers and grandmothers can the hermit showed grandpa brown the valley where the gypsies had been seen with their wagons shining with looking-glasses but the queer gypsies were gone though the ashes of their campfire showed where they had stopped and of course there were no horses left behind they don't stay very long in one place said grandpa brown if they had my horses they took them away i guess i'll never see them again for several days after getting lost bunny and sue did not have any adventures they played about the farmhouse or in the barn having much fun once they went fishing with bunker blue bunker did the fishing and caught five or six which grandma brown fried for supper one morning when bunny and sue came downstairs after a good night's sleep they saw their mother and grandmother busy in the kitchen putting cake and pies sandwiches pickles knives forks spoons and other things in baskets what's that for asked bunny a picnic answered his mother oh are we going on a picnic asked sue clapping her hands yes off in the woods her grandmother replied it is a sunday school picnic and grandpa and i go every year this time we will take you with us oh what fun we'll have cried bunny brown i just love a picnic don't you sue awful much answered the little girl end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of bunny brown and his sister sue on grandpa's farm by laura lee hope this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nan dodge the tramps bunny brown and his sister sue watched their mother and grandmother put in the baskets the good things they were to eat on the picnic which was to be held in a woodland grove about two miles away oh what a big cake exclaimed sue as she saw a coconut custard cake being taken from the shelf by her mother do you like that kind asked grandma brown i just love it cried sue standing on her tiptoes to look over the table so do i added bunny 
"'Yes, it is their favorite cake,' said Mother Brown. "'I always make it when they have a birthday, and on Christmas and New Year's Day.' "'But I don't know where we're going to put it,' said Grandma Brown. "'It is a fine big cake, but all the baskets are filled. "'If we crowd it in, it will crush, and, oh, don't squash our coconut cake, beg Sue. "'Don't spoil it, Mother.' "'I'll not, my dear. Perhaps we had better not take it along,' she said to Grandma Brown. "'We have enough to eat without it.' "'And we can eat it when we come home,' exclaimed Bunny. "'We'll be hungry, then. I'm always hungry after a picnic, aren't you, Sue?' "'Yes, Bunny. But, Mother, maybe we could take along some of the cake.' "'Oh, we have enough without that,' her grandmother told Sue. "'We'll save that until we get home. I'll put it in the pantry.' now all the baskets are packed get ready children grandpa will soon be here with the wagon and we'll ride off to the picnic grounds it's a lovely day it was the sun was shining down from the blue sky and there was a nice cool wind so that it was not too hot there had been a little rain the night before and the roads were not dusty it would be cool and fresh in the woods no better day for a picnic could be wished for Bunny and Sue were very happy. So was Splash the big dog, for he ran about here and there, barking and wagging his tail. To look at him you would have thought he had gotten up the whole picnic all by himself. Clean napkins were put over the lunch baskets. Lemon juice had been squeezed into glass jars with sugar, so that only water from a spring or well would have to be put in to make lemonade. Bunny and Sue were washed, combed, and dressed, all ready for the picnic. They did not wear their best clothes, for they wanted to romp about and play in the woods. Bunny said he was going to climb trees, and you can't do that if you wear your best clothes. But if you climb a tree, remarked Sue, don't get your foot caught in one as you did before, Bunny, and have to have your shoe taken off. I won't do that, promised the little boy. I'll only climb easy trees. I'm going to take two of my dolls, said Sue. Then if I see a little girl that hasn't any, I can lend her one of mine and we can play together. That will be nice, said Grandma Brown. Here comes Grandpa with the horses. Grandpa Brown drove up to the side door with a wagon that had three seats in it. He and Papa Brown would sit on the front one, where Grandpa could drive the horses. Bunny and Sue were to sit on the middle seat, and on the last one Grandma and Mother Brown would sit. "'But what about Bunker Blue?' asked Bunny. "'Isn't he coming, too?' For both Bunny and Sue liked the big red-haired boy very much, and he liked them. "'Oh, yes, Bunker is coming,' said Mother Brown. "'He is going to sit on a box in back of the last seat and hold the lunch basket so they won't bounce out of the wagon,' explained Grandpa Brown. "'And I'll hold him good and tight,' laughed Bunker. I won't let him go overboard. To go overboard means, of course, to fall out of a boat. Now the wagon in which Bunny Brown and the others rode to the picnic was not a boat. But you see, Bunker Blue was so used to being in and about boats that he always talked of them, speaking as sailors do. If anything is lost out of a boat, it goes overboard. And that was what Bunker was not going to let happen to the lunch baskets on the picnic trip. "'For if the lunch goes overboard, we'd go hungry,' he said, "'so I'll hold the baskets. "'These horses can't go as fast as my nice team that the gypsies took,' "'said Grandpa Brown when they were all ready to start. "'Well, we're in no hurry,' said Grandma Brown. "'The picnic will last all day.' "'As Grandpa drove out on the road, "'Bunny and Sue saw many wagons from other farms coming along.' It seemed that all who could were coming to the Sunday school picnic, which was held every year. In many of the farm wagons were boys and girls. Bunny and Sue looked at them, wondering if any of the little folks would play with them. Even if Grandpa's second team of horses did not go very fast, they were soon at the picnic grounds in a grove of trees near a pretty little lake. Grandpa put his wagon and horses under a shed with many others. The baskets of lunch were left there in the shade, and while the older folk found some benches to sit on and talk, Bunny and Sue, with other boys and girls, walked off through the woods to see what they could find. They found a pump where they had a drink of water. Then they tossed sticks into the lake, 
to make believe they were boats. There were also swings in the shade, and in these Bunny and another boy had a fine time. Sue said she did not care to swing just then. She had two dolls, one under each arm, and she walked about looking for some little girl to whom she might lend one, so they could play house together. Finally, Sue saw a little girl in a blue dress who seemed to be all alone. This little girl stood by herself watching the others play ring around the rosy. Sue went up to her and said kindly, Wouldn't you like to play dolls? Yes, yes, I would, but I haven't any doll. I'll let you take one of mine. Sue held out her best doll to the little girl. It is always polite, you know, to give company and your friends the best that you have, instead of keeping it yourself, no matter how much you want it. Oh, what a lovely doll, exclaimed the little girl, her eyes shining bright. Her name is Ethel, said Sue. Why, that's my name, exclaimed the little girl in the blue dress. Did you know that? No, answered Sue, I didn't. But I'm glad it is your name. Now we'll find a place to play house. Sue found a spot where some vines grew over an old stump, making a sort of green tent or leafy bower, like the one on the island where she and Bunny had played Robinson Crusoe. In that, Ethel and Sue had a fine time with the dolls. When it was time to eat the lunch from the baskets, Bunny and Sue asked if they could not take theirs and eat it with some of the other children who were going off by themselves. Sue wanted to be with Ethel, and Bunny had found a boy named John at one of the swings. He brought John to eat with him. Yes, you children may take your lunch off by yourselves, said Mother Brown. I thought you would want to do that, so I put it up in a separate basket for you. Bunker Blue carried the lunch for Bunny and Sue to a nice place in the woods, where a number of children were going to eat the good things their fathers and mothers had brought for them. The children had nearly finished eating when all at once the bushes near where Bunny was sitting were pushed to one side, and two rough-looking men, one large and one smaller, with ragged clothes and red handkerchief tied around their necks in place of collars, stepped out. And then one of the tramps, for that is what the men were, made a grab for the lunch basket that was near Bunny Brown. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Bunny Brown and his sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Missing Cake. The tramps had come through the bushes so quickly and had made such a sudden grab for the lunch basket that for a second or two Bunny Brown did not know what to do. Neither did his sister Sue, nor were the other children any better off. They just sat there looking at the rough men, one of whom had Bunny's basket and was taking out what was left of the sandwiches, cake, and other good things. Is there anything to eat in it? asked the little tramp of the big one who had Bunny's basket. Yes, some, was the answer. But there are more lunch baskets. Grab one for yourself. Of course, that was not a nice way to talk. Not very polite, you know. But perhaps tramps are different from other folks. They get so hungry at times that they forget to be polite, I guess. The smaller tramp, for one was much bigger and taller than the other, looked around to see what he could find. He saw little John Boland holding tightly to a basket. It still had some good things to eat in it, for John had not eaten all his lunch. Here, give me that, cried the tramp. No, no, John exclaimed, and he turned to run away, for he did not like the tramps, any more than did Bunny Brown or Sue or any of the others. But as John turned, his foot caught in a root of a tree, and down he went, striking the ground quite hard. His lunch basket bounced out of his hand and rolled to one side. Ha! That's what I want, said the tramp. I don't want you, little boy. All I want is something to eat. But John, I suppose, thought the tramps might take him away, as some people think gypsies will take children away, only they won't. And John began to cry. 
Now it is a funny thing, but very often, if one little boy or girl in a crowd of others begins to cry, why, two or three more will do the same thing. And no sooner had John begun to sob than Tilly Simpson, Nellie Haddon, Flo Benson, Tommy Jones, and Harry Kennedy all began to cry too. About the only ones who were not crying were Bunny Brown and his sister Sue. And Sue had some tears all ready to let fall out of her eyes. But Sue watched to see what Bunny would do. She did not want him to call her a crybaby afterward, though Bunny hardly ever called his sister names, except maybe in fun. You let us alone. Let my basket alone. Let John's basket alone. Go on away from here. The big tramp who was eating what was left in Bunny's basket looked up and laughed. You're a spunky little chap, he said, but we're not going away until we get something to eat. We're hungry. That's what we are, said the small tramp who had picked up the basket that had rolled from the hand of John. Out of this, the small tramp was eating pieces of cake and sandwiches as fast as he could. John, who had stopped crying now, sat up and looked on, his eyes wide open. We haven't had anything to eat all day, went on the big tramp, who was also eating fast. We're terrible hungry. You children have had enough. We'll take the rest. Yes, and then maybe we'll take some of them, said the small tramp, blinking his eyes and looking around. Of course he was only fooling, but the children did not know this, and some of the little girls screamed and ran away. But Bunny Brown was not so frightened as were the others. He was older, and then, too, he felt he must look after his sister, so he cried out again, Go on away from here, you, you bad tramps. The tramps only laughed. Then Bunny Brown thought of something. Turning around, he called as loudly as he could, Here, Splash! Come, Splash! Come on, old dog! Then Bunny whistled. He had only just learned how from Bunker Blue a few days before, and he could not whistle very loudly, but still he did very well for a small boy. Come, Splash, come on, old dog, he cried, and he whistled once more. The tramps looked at one another. He's calling his dog, said the big one. Yes, said the little tramp, we'd better go. Come on, we've had enough to last us for a while. We'll empty the baskets and run. The two roughly dressed men, with red handkerchiefs around their neck in place of collars, quickly emptied into their pockets the sandwiches and cake that were left in some of the baskets which the children had dropped. They mixed the cake and bread and meat all up together, those tramps did. Perhaps they were so hungry they did not mind. Then off they ran through the bushes the way they had come. Oh, I'm so glad they're gone, exclaimed Sue. So am I, said Tommy Jones. If they hadn't gone, your dog would have bit them, Bunny Brown, wouldn't he? Bunny Brown laughed. My dog isn't here, he said. He isn't, exclaimed Tommy. Why, he called him and whistled to him, didn't he? He asked the others. Yup, said Flo Benson, he did. That was only make-believe, explained Bunny. I thought maybe if I pretended Splash was here, the tramps would be afraid. Tramps are always afraid of dogs. My papa said so. That's why I made believe to call Splash. But he isn't here. We left him back on Grandpa's farm with the hired man. Mama thought he might be in the way at the picnic, so we didn't bring him. Oh, that was a fine trick, exclaimed Sue. I forgot Splash wasn't here with us. I thought sure he'd come when you whistled, Bunny. So did the tramps, I guess, laughed Bunny Brown. I'm glad I thought of it, and if Splash had been here, he would make the tramps go away anyhow. But they took all my lunch, sobbed John, and I fell down and I bumped my nose and, and... But that was all the trouble he could think of just then. Never mind, said Sue, helping him to stand up and brushing the dirt from his clothes. You're not hurt very much, John, and you're not hungry, are you? No, but... but I fell down. Well, never mind, the tramps are gone now, and they won't come back. But, just as Sue said that, someone was heard coming through the woods. 
The bushes shook, and some of the little girls cried out. Oh, there are the tramps again, shouted John. But it was not. It was only Bunker Blue, who had come to find Bunny Brown and his sister Sue. Well, how are you all? Bunker asked. Why, what's the matter? he went on, for he saw that something had happened. It was two bad tramps with red handkerchiefs on their necks, said Bunny Brown. But I made believe to whistle for Splash, and they ran away. They did, cried Bunker Blue, much surprised. Yup, and next time I'm really going to bring Splash to the picnic, and he can keep the tramps away. Maybe it would be a good idea, said Bunker, but it was a good thing you thought to pretend your dog was nearby. A very good trick. I'll see if I can see anything of the bad men. Bunker went through the bushes where the tramps had gone, but he saw nothing of them. They must have run a long way off. Perhaps they were afraid Bunny's dog, Splash, would chase them. The children had eaten as much as was good for them, even if they had not had all they wished, and I think most of them did have all they wanted. Bunny and Sue did, anyhow. Bunny's basket, of course, was emptied by the tramps, as was that of John and some of the others. But the grown folks still had good things left in theirs, and toward evening, when it was time to start for home, the little folks who had not had enough were given a little more. I didn't know there were tramps around here, said Mother Brown to Grandpa, when he was backing the horses out of the shed, so Bunny and the others could get into the wagon. Oh, yes, we have a few tramps in the summer, said Grandpa Brown. They don't like to work, but they are always ready to eat, but probably will not be bothered with many. Those two must have heard of the picnic, and come around to see what they could pick up. And now the picnic was over. The farmers began driving home. Everyone had had a fine time, and there had been no trouble except for the tramps. Oh, yes, there had been another little bit of trouble. A little boy named Sammy Perkins, in trying to catch a frog in the pond, leaned too far over and fell in. But a man pulled Sammy out very quickly, and the little boy only got wet through. Of course he cried and was frightened, but his mother took off some of his clothes and dried them in the sun, so no great harm was done. And that was all that happened, except that everyone had such a fine time that they said they wished there was a picnic every day. But that would be too much, said Grandma Brown. You would soon get tired of it. The Brown family drove home, getting there just as the sun was going down. Splash, who had been chained up by the hired man so he would not follow the wagon, was now let loose, and oh, how glad he was to see Bunny Brown and his sister Sue. Splash jumped about, barking and wagging his tail. He even tried to kiss Bunny and Sue with his red tongue. Oh, Splash, cried Bunny, I wish you had been to the picnic. Then you could have run after the tramps. Well, the tramps ran anyhow, so it was all right, said Papa Brown. Though the next time you see any rough men, Bunny, you had better come and tell me or your mother, and not try to drive them away all by yourself. All right, I will, Daddy. But we'll take Splash to the next picnic anyhow. He was lonesome without us. And I think Splash was. Well, now we'll have supper, said Grandma Brown. That is, if you children are hungry. Oh, I am, cried Sue, and Bunny said the same thing. The drive home had given them good appetites, but then children are very often hungry anyhow, even without picnics. Shall we have some of that nice coconut custard cake? asked Bunny. Yes, his grandmother told him, I'll get it from the pantry. But when she went there, the cupboard was not exactly bare, like Mother Hubbard's, but something had happened. For Grandma Brown cried, Oh, the cake, the lovely cake is gone, and so are a lot of my pies and crullers. Oh, someone has been in my pantry. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge Bunny's Big Idea 
Bunny Brown ran to the pantry where his grandmother had gone. Sue followed. The two children saw Grandma Brown looking at some empty shelves. On one shelf, before they had started for the picnic, had stood the big coconut custard cake. It was too large to go in any of the baskets. That was why it had been left home for supper. Oh, is it really gone? asked Bunny sadly. It isn't here, said Grandma Brown. Could the hired man have taken it? asked Bunny's mother. Oh, no, he wouldn't do such a thing as that, replied Grandma Brown. I left his dinner in the kitchen, as I always do when we go away. No, someone must have gotten in the house while we were gone and taken the cake besides some of my pies and other things. Was it, was they burglars, asked Sue? She had often heard at home of burglars getting into houses and taking money and other things. No, I don't believe it was burglars, said Grandma Brown, but I see how they got in. I left the pantry window open, though the shutters were closed. They opened the shutters and climbed in. The shutters were tied with a string, and the string has been cut, see? She showed Bunny and Sue, also Mother Brown, where the cut string hung dangling from the edge of one shutter. They climbed in that window and took the cake, went on Grandma Brown. Oh, my lovely cake, exclaimed Sue, and I wanted some for supper. So did I, said Bunny Brown. Is there any other kind of cake, Grandma? Oh, yes, I can give you cookies, but I would like to know who it was got in my pantry. We don't generally trouble to lock our doors and windows around here in the daytime, she went on, for none of us was ever robbed before. But if this is going to happen, I'll have to be more careful. She pushed open the shutters, which were partly closed, and looked out. Then she called, Oh, here's a box they stepped on to get in the window. Look, children, they brought a box from the barn, stepped up on it, and crawled in the window. And see, one of them dropped his handkerchief. Bunny and Sue, looking under Grandma Brown's arms, one on each side of her, saw down on the ground a red handkerchief. At the sight of it, Bunny Brown cried, Oh, it was the tramps. It was the tramps that took our cake, Grandma. How do you know, Bunny? Because the tramps that scared us had red handkerchiefs on their necks, just like that one down there. I'm sure they were the same tramps, Grandma. The two children, Grandma and Mother Brown, went outside under the pantry window. There lay the red handkerchief on the ground, and it was twisted up in just the way a handkerchief would be twisted if it had been around anyone's neck. Those tramps didn't get enough to eat out of our baskets, said Bunny Brown, so they came here and took Grandma's things. Let's go after them. I'll get Splash and... Bunny Brown started to run after his dog that had gone out to the barn with Bunker Blue, but his mother caught the little boy by the arm. You had better stay right here, she said. You are too small to go chasing off after tramps, even with Splash. We'll let Papa Brown and Grandpa find the bad men. They are still here. Daddy Brown and Grandpa came back from the barn where they had been putting away the horses, and they were told of the missing cake, pies, and crullers. Then they looked at the red handkerchief lying where one of the tramps must have dropped it. Yes, I should not be surprised if the same tramps who scared the children came here and took your things, Mother, said Papa Brown. They must have been frightened and have run off in a hurry to have dropped their handkerchief this way. We'll ask the hired man." But the hired man had been working in the garden some distance away from the house, and he had seen nothing of any tramps. He had come in to his dinner, and he said he had looked in the pantry then, and had noticed that the big cake was all right. Then the tramps came here after dinner, and after they were at the picnic ground, said Grandpa Brown. I must look around. They may be hiding in my barn." and sometimes tramps smoke in the hay and set it on fire. We'll look for them. But no tramps were found. Maybe they heard Splash barking, and ran away in such a hurry that they dropped their handkerchief, said Bunny. Maybe, agreed his mother. Well, it's better to have them take the crullers, the pie, and the cake instead of a cow or a horse. Indeed it is, said Grandpa Brown. 
I don't want to lose any more horses. I can bake you another coconut custard cake, children, said Grandma Brown. I'll make it tomorrow. Tonight you will have to eat cookies with your milk. And the cookies were very good, as was everything Grandma Brown made. So Bunny and Sue were not hungry after all. That night, Grandpa Brown went all around the house to make sure that all the doors and windows were locked. For we don't want any tramps coming here in the middle of the night, waking us up from our sleep, he said. And nothing happened. Probably the tramps ran a good way off with the fine big coconut custard cake. They must have had a good feast on that and on the pies and crullers. For two or three days after the picnic, Bunny Brown and his sister Sue had good times at Grandpa's farm. One day it rained, but the children played a part of the time in the barn and the rest of the time in the big attic of Grandpa's house. The attic had in it even more things to have a good time with than did the attic at Bunny's home. There were big fur rugs that Grandpa Brown put in the sled when it was winter. There were strings of sleigh bells that jingled when they were touched and there was a spinning wheel like the one in Mother Brown's attic, only it was larger. Then, too, there were piles of old clothes, old picture papers, trunks with many strange things in them, and so many other things that Bunny and Sue did not get tired of playing all day long. But the attic was only nice to play in on rainy days, on days when the sun shone down hot on the roof. It was too warm up there. So the next day, when the storm was over, Bunny and Sue looked for something else to do to have a good time. "'Come on, and we'll play ball,' said Bunny. He and Sue did not exactly play ball the way big boys did, but Bunny would throw the ball, and when Sue had caught it, she would toss it back. They went out behind the house to play this game. Back and forth they tossed the ball, until Sue missed it when Bunny threw it to her. The ball rolled under a currant bush, but when Sue ran to pick it up, the little girl suddenly stopped and stood looking at the bush. "'What's the matter?' asked Bunny. "'Why don't you pick the ball up and throw it to me, Sue?' "'I, I can't,' she answered. "'Why not?' "'Cause a hen's got it.' "'A hen's got my ball?' asked Bunny, much surprised. Yup, said Sue, shaking her head up and down to make Bunny understand." The ball is right by the hen, and she's got her bill on it. I dasn't pick it up, cause she'll peck me. Bunny ran to where Sue stood. Surely enough, the ball had rolled under the edge of the currant bush, close to where a big hen was all cuddled up in a heap, and the hen did have her bill on the ball, with which the children had been playing. Why, why, that hen is on a nest, exclaimed Bunny. I guess Grandma doesn't know there's a hen's nest out here. We'll go and tell her. But aren't you going to take your ball, asked Sue. Maybe the hen will eat it if you don't. Hens can't eat balls, said Bunny. The ball is too big for them to swallow. Well, anyhow, they could pick holes in it, and then we couldn't play with it any more. That's so, agreed Bunny. I'll see if I can get it away from her. But when Bunny crept under the currant bush and reached for his ball, the hen made a funny clucking noise, ruffled up her feathers, and looked so angry that Bunny was afraid. Maybe she's got little chickens in her nest, said Sue. If she has, she'll peck you if you go close to her. Grandma said so. Maybe she has, agreed Bunny, but I'll get a long stick and poke my ball out. Then she can't peck me but it was not easy to make the ball roll out of the way of the hen. The stick would slip off it when Bunny reached for it, and whenever the stick came near the hen, she would peck at it. Once she almost knocked it from Bunny's hand. And all the while the hen made that queer clucking noise and fluffed up her feathers so that she looked twice as big as she really was. Oh, come away, come away, begged Sue. She'll bite you, Bunny. Bunny Brown was a little afraid of the hen, and when he found he could not roll the ball out of her way, he ran to the house with Sue and told his mother and grandmother what had happened. Why, that must be the old gray hen sitting on her nest that she went off and made by herself, said Grandma Brown. I wondered where she was hiding. 
but I never thought to look under the currant bush. I'm glad you found her, Bunny. I'll get your ball for you. The hen did not seem to mind when Grandma Brown went close to her. Very carefully, Grandma reached for Bunny's ball. Then she gently lifted up one of the hen's wings and showed the children the eggs under her feathers. Soon some little chickens will hatch out of the eggs, said Grandma. Some of the shells are already cracked, and the chickies may be out tomorrow. Oh, I'll just love to see them, cried Sue. Now that they had their ball again, Bunny and Sue could play once more, and the next day the little chickens did hatch. Up to the house came the old mother hen with eleven little fluffy yellow balls, almost as round as Bunny's ball, but of course not so big. Peep, peep, went the little chickens as they followed the hen mother around. Cluck, cluck, said the hen mother. Oh, aren't they cute, cried Sue. Everyone thought they were, and I think the hen mother was very proud of them, for if anyone went too near she would make a queer noise and ruffle up her feathers, just as she had when Bunny reached for his ball near her. It was two or three days after this that Bunny Brown and his sister Sue awakened one morning and saw something queer out on the side of Grandpa's barn. Oh, look, exclaimed Sue, who saw it first. What a big picture, Bunny. Indeed, it was a large one, brightly colored, showing elephants, lions, tigers, and horses, all in a big ring, and there were men and ladies jumping from the top of a tent into nets underneath. Oh, it's a circus picture, cried Bunny. How did it get there, Grandpa? A man came along early this morning and pasted it up, said Grandpa Brown. Bunny and Sue ran out to look at the circus picture. It was a fine big one, and the more they looked at it, the more the children liked it. Finally, Bunny said, Sue, I've got an idea, such a big idea. Oh, what is it? asked Sue. What's an idea? Is it good to eat? Bunny did not exactly know what an idea was, but he had heard his mother and father say that word. Sue, exclaimed Bunny in a sort of whisper, if that circus is coming to town, we'll go. You and me, we'll go to the circus. Oh, Bunny, cried Sue, clapping her hands. That will be just fine. But how can we go? End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. Off to the Circus. Bunny Brown thought for a minute. He and Sue looked at the gay circus poster, and the more he looked at it, the more he felt that he and his sister must go and see the big show in the white tent. How can we go, Bunny? asked Sue. Bunny Brown wrinkled up his forehead. He always did that when he was thinking hard, and now that the big idea had come to him, he was thinking harder. First we'll have to find out where the circus is going to be, he said. We'll ask Grandpa. He'll know. Do you suppose Mother will let us go? asked Sue. I don't know. We'll have to ask. First we'll find out where the show is going to be. Bunny and Sue stood a little while longer, looking at the circus picture. As they turned this way and that, peering at the big elephant, the savage-looking lion, the striped tiger, and the hippopotamus with his mouth so widely open, Bunker Blue came along, whistling. Maybe Bunker knows, cried Sue. Knows what? asked the red-haired lad, stopping near the two children. What do you think I know? Where the circus is going to be, replied Bunny. Do you know where they'll put up the tent? Bunker squinted at the circus poster. No, I don't know exactly where it will be, he said, and it doesn't tell on that sign, but it says the circus is coming day after tomorrow. You could find out from your grandpa's hired man, though, where the tents will be. I guess they will put them up in the same place they had them last year, and the hired man was here then. He's worked for your grandpa a good many years. Ask the hired man. We will, Bunny said. Are you thinking of going to the circus? asked Bunker. We, we'd like to, answered Sue softly. 
and maybe we will added her brother you're too little to go to a circus said bunker blue and i don't believe any of the big folks are going i'd like to go myself but i don't believe i can well we're going anyhow whispered bunny to sue so bunker would not hear are you sure bunny sure we'll go he said just you leave it all to me at dinner that day bunny and sue talked of nothing but the circus and the big picture poster on grandpa's barn it's the same show that was here last year said the hired man i saw the fellow who pasted the picture on the barn and he was the same one who was around last year and and will the tent be in the same place asked bunny yes said the hired man a circus always shows in the same place when it comes to town they put the tents up by the baseball grounds just outside of the town bunny had found out what he wanted to know if he and sue could get to town all they would have to do would be to ask where the baseball grounds were anyone could tell them that and then they would find the circus but first bunny wanted to find out if his papa and mamma or grandfather and grandmother were going to the show it would be so much easier for him and sue if they were so bunny asked could we go to the circus mother oh i hardly think so answered mother brown i don't like a circus and your father has to go to the city that day to look after his boat business grandpa is too busy to go and i'm sure grandma and i don't want to go no indeed exclaimed grandma brown i always was afraid of wild animals and i don't like a circus anyhow bunker blue could take us said bunny no dear i'm sorry but bunker is going to drive papa into town on that day so he could not take you you had a nice time at the picnic and that ought to be enough for you this is only a small circus and i don't believe it would be nice for you to go said mother brown but bunny brown and his sister sue wanted very much to go to this circus even if it was only a small one oh bunny we can't go said sue with tears in her eyes when she and bunny went out in the yard after dinner we can't go to the circus maybe we can insisted bunny but how can we mother isn't going nor father nor grandma nor grandpa how can we go we can go by ourselves it isn't very far into town not more than a mile we can walk a mile sue yes but who will give us the money for tickets do they sell tickets to the circus for pins bunny if they did maybe we could find enough pins in grandma's house on the floor nobody wants those pins we could pick em up they don't sell real circus tickets for pins explained bunny they sell them for money i've got five cents said sue so have i but that won't be enough it's twenty-five cents for children bunker read that on the circus poster oh we'll never get that much money sighed sue maybe we will bunny said how well i might carry water to the elephant and the man might give me a ticket for that bunker said he once got in the circus that way but i couldn't carry water to an elephant objected sue i'd be afraid he'd bite me i'd carry it for you kindly offered bunny i'm not afraid of an elephant if you're kind to them they won't bite you but elephants is so big they take an awful lot of water sue went on they'd drink a whole tub full you could never carry that much i'll try said bunny i want to go to that circus and so do i bunny they didn't say we mustn't go the little boy went on mother just said she and grandma couldn't take us i don't think they'd mind if we went by ourselves maybe not bunny but supposin they wouldn't let us in the tent oh i guess they will you could carry some water for the ponies you're not afraid of them are you no said sue slowly i'm not afraid of ponies i'll get them some water bunny but maybe they have all the water they want and they won't let us in no matter what we do bunny thought that over for a minute then he said we could do our punch and judy show for the circus man sue maybe he'd let us in if he saw that maybe but bunny you haven't any lobster claw to put on your nose to make you look like mr punch bunny sighed 
That's so, he said. The lobster claw is broken. I guess we'll have to carry the water, Sue. I'll get some for the elephant, and you can carry some for the ponies. Then the circus man will give us tickets to the show. We'll go, anyhow. So Bunny had it all planned out. Neither he nor Sue said anything to their father, mother, or grandparents about what they were going to do. Bunny was quite sure if they asked, they would not be allowed to go, and he did not want to do anything he was told not to do. But he and Sue had not really been forbidden to go to the circus, though of course Mrs. Brown had no idea the children were planning to see the show in the tent with the wild animals and the men and women jumping into nets. The rest of the day Bunny and Sue spent pretty much out near the barn, looking at the big circus poster, wondering if they would see all the animals in the picture. They spent part of the next day doing the same thing. Mrs. Brown was so busy helping Grandma Brown, and Mr. Brown was so busy getting ready for his trip to the city, that no one paid much attention to the children. "'We'll start off early tomorrow morning,' said Bunny, the night before the circus was to come to town. "'We'll take a lunch with us. I'll save some of my supper and some of my breakfast. We can take some bread and cake, and we've each got five cents to get some pink lemonade with.' "'I want a circus balloon, too,' said Sue. "'Well, maybe a man will give you one,' said Bunny, hopefully." Sue clapped her hands in joy. I hope he gives me a red one, she cried. Early the next morning, right after breakfast, Bunny Brown and his sister Sue went quietly from the house. They had wrapped some slices of bread and some cookies in pieces of newspaper, and this lunch they carried with them as they started off for the circus. No one saw them start, and down the road they went, hand in hand, off toward town. Oh, Bunny, cried Sue, as she toddled along beside her brother. Isn't it just fine? Wait till you see the circus, said Bunny, his eyes shining with delight. We'll have lots of fun. End of chapter 22